We have come into his presence this morning, and I invite you to stand and join together in our liturgy on this anniversary Sunday. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all God's benefits. Who forgives your iniquity, who heals your diseases, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. be with you and also with you let us pray let us in penitence and humility confess our sins before the throne of grace praying together God, God of, of mercy, mercy as we, we mark, mark this moment we confess, confess our weaknesses failures and transgressions our broken vows our slackness and misuse of time and opportunity our selfishness and our love of ease our unkindness and indifference, our self-indulgence and our pleasures taken at the expense of others, our moments when we have not been true to ourselves, our lack of faith in your providence. For these sins of commission and omission, have mercy upon us. Please be seated or you may kneel if you choose to do so. Lord Jesus Christ, we remember in your presence our losses and griefs, our hopes and treasures throughout the years, the disappointments we have known, the victories we have celebrated, the friends who are no longer with us and whose steps we shall hear no more, and the new friends we have come to know and love. Give us comfort and a deep sense of your goodness in every circumstance of life, and when, despite our good intentions, we fail, be our strength and stay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy, thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your throne is established in righteousness, your compassions fail not, and your love endures from generation to generation. Lift the light of your countenance upon us, for we are exiles as our ancestors were. 
We thank you for all the ways by which you have led us in the past. Give us courage to set our faces toward the future. Amen. Amen. Let us give thanks for all God's mercies, for grace given to us in the days that are gone, for the blessings of life, seen and unseen, for the joy and peace of communion with you. We give you thanks, gracious God. For the sacraments of love and service that have made us conscious of your presence in our common life. For the deeds we have been able to accomplish in the strength which you supply. For the kindness of associates, the love of friends, and the fellowship of kindred souls. We give you thanks, loving God. For the disciplines which have enriched our living for your wisdom and gracious providence which we have recognized when you have denied our foolish requests, for the faith which has guided us in days of trial. We give you thanks, gracious God. Please stand. God will supply every need of ours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to everyone on this July 25th, our anniversary Sunday. We're glad you're here. Last Sunday, several of you noticed that there was not a white rose in memory of Judy Renfro. That was actually by design because I knew what was coming. These flowers that you see here today are really a gift from Judy posthumously as they are from her garden. Harold agreed that this would be a wonderful way for us all to remember Judy and her great gardening efforts in a place where she really loved to be close to God. And so our flowers today are in memory of Judy Renfro, and we continue to remember that family. Immediately after the service today in the Friendship Room, there will be our tech session. So anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about how to navigate our website and all the things, all the information that's available through that website, please go back to the um, Friendship Room and we'll have a good time for an hour learning a little more. Some of you have asked about our plans for South Fork. Now that it's almost August, all thoughts turn to back to school. We are having a meeting. Marla Sparks will be um, meeting with the principal and the community liaison during the first week of August. And so if you haven't made plans yet to participate in some sort of back to school effort, just hold on. Let's find out what she learns and we'll report to you after that meeting. Baseball tickets are here. They are available for pickup any morning this week. Rachel's here, excuse me, here until 1230. They are for Sunday, August 15th at two o'clock. It has been confirmed that you'll be in the shade, and the tickets are $5 each. Open Door resumes in September, picking up where we left off over one year ago. We'll be delivering a hot meal to some of our homebound church members. It will be on the first Wednesday of each month. And thanks to those of you who completed our questionnaire and survey back in June, we have adequate volunteers. I'll be communicating with you more by the middle of August. Now. 
Earlier this summer, I had a conversation with a church member who is recently retired. She told me about a new hobby that she has begun in her retirement, and I was fascinated not only by the hobby, but also by the backstory. After our conversation, I asked Rachel, hey, isn't our anniversary coming up? And when she told me that it was our 175th, everything came together. I could just picture the title on the book, New Philadelphia Moravian Church, 175 years, 175 stories, the congregation you never knew. Wouldn't it be wonderful, you don't look that excited so far, um, <laughs> wouldn't it be wonderful if a year from now we had a book to sell or give to each of you that contained stories of people in this congregation. Now, as surely as I'm standing here, when I look out on all of you, I know there are 175 fascinating stories. I do not mean the kinds of things that we will learn from your obituary. I mean things that we would never know about you right now unless we ask and unless you tell us. Now here's what it's gonna take, and this is the kind of scary part. Not every idea is meant to be executed. So this one may not be all that great. Only you will tell, because what we'll need are 20 people. And if you think you aren't a great writer, doesn't matter, there are plenty of people who can do a lot of editing, but you will have to put pen to paper. 20 of you to be willing to interview eight people each, over the next eight months. What do you think so far? <laughs> um, what I'll need from you is not only that, but I need to hear from you. I'm not gonna call and bug you. If you think this is worth pursuing, and 20 of you, by the way, we have four commitments, so really 16 more of you who would be willing to conduct eight interviews, I would give you the contact information for the people to interview, then we will carry forward with this idea. We'll need to do it over the course of eight months so that we have three, three months to edit and put it all together. If I don't hear from you, you just won't hear another peep from me about this idea. So you will determine whether or not we should pursue it. And there you go. Thank you. Clyde, having worked with you for a year, I'm not real sure about, you won't hear another peep out of me part, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think it's a great idea. And I think people were waiting to show their excitement when you would say, who's doing this? <laughs> but wonderful, thank you. Let's join together in a time of prayer, giving thanks for God's goodness to us throughout these past 175 years.
God, you are good. You are faithful. You have led us by your spirit and fed us with your word throughout many years. You've raised up faithful servants to be your hands and feet and, and heart in this community and in the world. We thank you for those who have gone before us. We thank you for so many who are serving you right now. And we thank you for the lives and souls and hearts that will come to know you in the coming years. Thank you, God, that we can always be assured of your presence with us. You smile and rejoice with us in our celebrations and victories, but we know that you are with us in our sorrows and the challenges that we face each day. We're grateful that you have called us to be part of the body of Christ in this world. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. We pray for Kathy Dahl and Brian Huffman, and Melvin Holland. We continue to lift up Jeff Kreisen and Michael Kratz in our prayers and, and others who, who need your presence. Enfold them, engulf them, with your comforting and healing presence, dear Lord. God, you are our rock, our refuge, our fortress, our strength. Give us a mixture of courage and compassion, O oh Lord, that we might see the needs around us as opportunities for serving you. Give us a servant heart, dear God, that we might serve you ever more faithfully as you lead us onward. And although the way sometimes might be cheerless, we will follow calm, and fearless. Guide us by your hand to the promised land. In Jesus' name, amen. We can continue to support the ministries and missions of New Philadelphia Moravian Church with our gifts and tithes and offerings. There are offering plates in the vestibule, and you can mail the offerings in to New Philadelphia at 4440 Country Club Road, 27104, or visit the website newphilly.org and use one of the secure giving portals there. Let's pray. Creating God, we are thankful for all that you have done and all that you continue to do in our world today. May your spirit awaken us to be people of action today in building up others and the kingdom of God and use our gifts for your purposes. Amen.
This morning's reading from, our, from the Hebrew texts comes from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 through 44. A man came from Baal Shalishah, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in a sack. Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. But a servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. He set it before them. They ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson comes from Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 21. Paul prays for the church of Ephesus and for us. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The good news today, our gospel reading, is taken from the sixth chapter of John's account of the gospel, beginning with the first verse and going all the way through the 21st verse. Two stories showing Jesus' power and Jesus' compassion. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. 
Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. May God add his blessing to not only the reading, but the, the understanding of his word. Good morning and welcome to the children's time. So imagine with me this morning that you are this fan. It's hot. The people around you are hot and whiny. And you can do something about it. You want to do something. You want to fix it. You want to change the world around you. But you turn on and nothing happens. Hmm. Wait a minute. I don't know what this thing is, but looks like it's supposed to go together. What if? Hey! Now you have the power to make things change. In the scripture that we heard from Ephesians just now, this was what Paul was praying for, for the people of Ephesus, that they would be able to fully understand the amazing power available to them from God with Jesus inside. Paul says, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow. That's a pretty awesome hope for us, too. But let's jump to the gospel that we heard from John chapter 6. Crowds had been listening to Jesus' teaching, and Jesus told his disciples, take care of them, get them something to eat. Well, did the disciples know how to take care of all those 5,000 people and get them something to eat? Do they have the power to feed all those people on the hillside? No way. But they didn't have to. They had to trust in the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of Jesus' love and power. They didn't have to answer the, have the answers. They didn't have to have the power themselves. They just had to hold the basket. Later in the passage, Jesus is walking on the water, miles away from the land. The disciples, did they have to be able to walk on the water? No, they had to be in the boat 
with their eyes fixed on Jesus to witness the power of God on full display walking on the waves. So this is such a cool passage for us to hear this morning, for us to hear every morning, because it really, really has an important message for us. The message? Relax. We want to do good. We want to be excellent. We want to have all the answers. We want to make life better. We want to be perfect. Well, those are all good things to strive for, right? So let me ask each of you people this morning, big people too, do you always do good things? Are you always excellent at everything you try? No. Do you always have all the answers to life problems? Me either. Are you perfect? No. Relax. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to have all the answers. Remember our fan? It's hot. The fan can fix the problem. Well, it can't on its own, but it can when it's plugged in. Now it can fix the problem. When the 5,000 people on the hillside needed food, did the disciples know how to solve the problem? No. But they got plugged in with Jesus and fixed the problem. Once and it, was, it was in his hands, all they had to do was pass the baskets. So the disciples know how to walk on water? They didn't have to. They just had to leave it to Jesus and watch. And then while they watched, they saw the full power of God, the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, the love that surpasses understanding in the person of Jesus. Paul prays for believers to be able to see and feel and know that power that's given to us and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, surpasses understanding. We have to relax. and We have to plug in to Jesus, trust our problems and our efforts and our way ahead, and then let him and his power flow through us. We don't have to have the answers. We have to be plugged in. So today and this week, let's try to focus every day and get a little bit better each day at not worrying and getting anxious about life and its problems. Instead, plug in to the power of Jesus more and more, more deeply and more deeply, and then let Jesus handle it, and then relax and watch what happens. Children, come on out to kids' worship. I feel like I need to start with a disclaimer today, or maybe it's more of a warning. In case I seem a little bit um, loopy, I guess is the word, or some siblings might say loopier. Uh, you see, yesterday at this time, 
I was taking part in the closing circle of senior high camp at Mount Morris in Wisconsin. And yesterday afternoon, I went to the Milwaukee airport about two hours from the camp, ready to catch my flight to Chicago and then on to Greensboro. It looked great on paper, but the flight was canceled. And they told me they could put me on another flight today. Well, I told the agent that I needed to be in church in North Carolina at 9.30 this morning. And she said, well, we do have churches here, you know. <laughs> and I said, I'm preaching. And she said, oh. So she put me on a direct flight to Charlotte, where I arrived at around 10 o'clock last night, and then hopped in a taxi that American Airlines paid for, and by the way, if you ever wonder, from Charlotte Airport to Greensboro Airport is $246 in a taxi. And I picked up my car and drove to Clemens and got home at 1.15 this morning. But I offer this dis disclaimer not just because of my travel schedule yesterday, but because of the schedule throughout the week. One of my duties as worship leader for the week was to lead vespers at the end of campfire each evening. Now, campfire began every night sometime between 10 and 10.30, and my time started somewhere between 10.30 and 11. And then there was devotions at 7 a.m., morning worship at 9, activities in the afternoon, and evening worship every night from 6.45 until 7.30, followed by the evening program and, again, campfire. But my disclaimer isn't just about the schedule. Sometimes it can be a challenge to change gears from the craziness of camp and come back to everyday life. For example, I was thinking about warning Clyde that she shouldn't use the word announcements because people might jump up and start singing announcements, announcements, announcements. But I realized that wouldn't be necessary since we're not at camp. Worship services and programs at camp, and by the way, the program was Jesus, like, follow, share. And it was a very good program, but the, the programs at camp involved doing creative and, and difficult things with, with red and blue plastic cups and throwing axes at, at bullseyes and eating strange combinations of food items like orange slices and Oreos with mustard and pickle juice and cheese whiz. Don't try it. Even raising money for mission takes on interesting forms. The campers were given incentives for raising money for various mission causes. If they raised $250, they would get to have a water fight. If they raised $500, we would have a make your own ice cream Sunday night. But the incentive for raising $750 was that I would have to get a Moravian seal tattooed on the top of my head. <laughs> well, thankfully, they reached this goal by Tuesday, and I was able to wash the tattoo off by Friday. Otherwise, I might have had to ask Valerie to be careful with the camera angles today. <laughs> but those amazing campers ended up raising over $3,500 for mission this week, and a group of businessmen and women matched that amount, so over $7,000 was raised. It was a wonderful week. And it's not always easy to come back down from a mountaintop experience, even if that experience isn't on a mountain, but in the Wisconsin woods. But today we celebrate our anniversary as a congregation. And I can't just use this time to give you a report of my week away, my week at camp. Today we look back not just on the past week, but rather over the past 175 years. And we look back even farther to February 13th, 1842, when Brother Schultz preached in the schoolhouse that was called Philadelphia. And, and four months later, it was referred to as New Philadelphia. It had been 62 years since the last two Moravian congregations, Hope and Friedland, had been planted in this area. But on July 26th, 1846, New Philadelphia was officially organized and in 1849, land was purchased between the new and old Shalliford Roads. And on November 1st, 1851, the little church in the midst of the forest was dedicated. A hundred years ago yesterday, on July 24th, 1921, 
the second sanctuary was dedicated. And then getting close to 50 years ago on September 8th, 1963, this sanctuary was dedicated. So we look back and celebrate how far we've come with God's help. And we see how God has been with us. I celebrate the fact that these buildings that I've mentioned can be used for many purposes and that even in the midst of a difficult year, they've continued to be used for Imprints Cares and Mount Jubilee Ministries and in many other ways. And now we look forward to filling them with people and activities and the sounds of children laughing and playing and the sounds of singing and, and bells ringing and instruments all giving praise to the God who has been our help in ages past and is our hope for years to come. Now two of the scripture readings assigned for today remind us that we're not in this alone. The passage in John shows how Jesus can do great things like feeding thousands of people and giving them hope and comfort through us when, like the disciples, we are willing to be his hands and feet and when, like the little boy in the story, we're willing to offer our gifts for God's glory and God's work in the world. The shorter passage in 2 Kings reminds us that, that, that people, mere mortals like Elisha, may not quite compete with Jesus' feeding of 5,000, but feeding 100 people is certainly a significant ministry, and we too can do that when we align ourselves with God's purposes and follow God's word. And Paul's letter to the Ephesians shows us where all this blessing and this ability to bless others begins. Did you hear that last word? Begins. Big ends. Now, believe it or not, the young adults at camp this past week, since they were all from Wisconsin, and they taught me to say it correctly, and Minnesota, and Michigan, and North Dakota, and Illinois and Indiana and, and Ohio, they thought that I had a very thick southern accent. And they always wanted to say, oh, say this or say, say this. And they said that I replaced all of my E's with I's. So I would say pin instead of pen and tin instead of ten. And some of them started speaking southern to make me feel at home. Well, I don't think that I sound that southern, but I do say begin. And in this Ephesians passage, I see at least seven big ends, seven important words that have to do with those two letters, I in. Paul says, I pray that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. And then he says, now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. And he says, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. And I find these words to be inspirational, instructional, and informational. And as I read this passage, I, I, I heard Paul telling us what what can be in us and what we can be in. I'm going to say that again to make sure I say it right, that Paul is telling us what can be in us and what we can be in. Paul says that we can have strength in our inner being through the power of the Spirit that is in us. He says that Christ can dwell in our hearts through faith. So the power of the Spirit and the presence of Christ in us. But then he says that we can be rooted and grounded in love. So again, the presence of Christ in us, the power of the Spirit in us, and we are rooted and grounded in love. It reminds me of a portion of the prayer of St. Patrick. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me. Now, I mentioned the various states that were represented at camp this past week. A lot of the campers were from rural areas, sons and daughters of dairy farmers and grain growers. But some of them were also from the inner city of Milwaukee, from some pretty tough 
parts of town. Some of them shared with the rest of us about the struggles that they face in their everyday lives. And after worship one evening, one of the young men from the inner city came up to me and said, can you pray for me? He said, when I was 15, my mom was shot and killed by gang members in our neighborhood. He said, she got caught in the middle of a gunfight. And he said, it's been a few years, but I still feel it every day. I just need you to pray for me. Now, sometimes when people ask you to pray for them, they mean they want you to put them on your prayer list. But I could tell that this young man meant now, not in your evening or morning prayers, right now. So we stood there and prayed as other campers made their way out of the meeting tent and headed to their small groups. And it was a powerful moment. Well, I asked him if he would be willing to share his story as part of my Vesper time at Campfire. And he said he was nervous, but that he would. And as we sat around a crackling fire in the serenity of that peaceful place, he told a tragic story of violence and bloodshed and hatred. But then something happened. As we prayed and sang, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, the circle of campers and counselors around that campfire started closing in. They formed a shell around this young man. And some laid hands on him and prayed for him and hugged him and engulfed him in God's love. And he seemed to get a glimpse of what Paul refers to as the breadth and length and height and depth of Christ's love. Well, the next day, another young man from Milwaukee came up to me and told me that his brother and cousin were killed a couple of years ago, and he asked me if he could share his story. Well, I know how important it is to be able to express these things in a safe environment. He told me that in his neighborhood, he would never be able to open up and share his feelings. His friends would say, come on, man, get over it, move on. You gotta be tough, man. So having the chance to tell his story would be good for him. But I knew that it was about more than that. I knew that he knew what would happen if he told the story. And he wanted that. He needed that. He needed to experience the breadth and length and height and depth of God's love. And the campers didn't let him or me down. He too was engulfed in God's love. And I was reminded of an experience at Laurel Ridge about 10 years ago. Bishop Hopeton Clennon was leading the program. We were sitting in the assembly hall somewhere between 11 a.m. and noon. It was hot and muggy, and it was almost time for lunch. And Hopeton started reading a passage from Revelation chapter 21 where it talks about the dimensions of heaven. And I remember thinking, brother, you're a wonderful preacher, but you got to know your audience, your context. The program usually involves soaking campers with water guns and running around and doing silly stuff, and he's standing up there reading about an angel measuring the new Jerusalem. Well, this is what he read. He said, the angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he looked up and said, heaven is shaped like a cube, a perfect cube. Its length and width and height are equal. And to my surprise, the campers were fascinated. And then he turned to Matthew and read the great commandment. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And Hopeton said, the great commandment is shaped like a cube. Our love for God, our love for neighbor, and our love for ourselves. 
And he said, when we get these in the proper proportion, we get a taste of heaven on earth. And then he turned to Ephesians, our passage for today, and he read, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth so that you may be filled with the fullness of God and know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. He said the love of Christ is like a cube. It's not just a one or two dimensional circle. It's around us and above us and below us and within us. And those young men from Milwaukee found out what it's like to be caught up in that cube, cradled and comforted in that cube. That's what the church needs to be. It's what the church is called to be, a community that is filled with the power of the Spirit and the presence of Christ, a cube, a place where people can be engulfed in the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge but we can't bask in the beauty of that cube. The two young men from Milwaukee certainly wished they could do that. It would have been so nice to just stay standing near the light of that campfire and, and feel the warmth of their fellow campers' love and concern, just wrapping them in love. And as we find ourselves with more and more opportunities for fellowship and for being together, we might be tempted to do the same. But that day at Laurel Ridge, as a result of those words in Revelation and Matthew and Ephesians, more than 100 campers ended up starting something called M-Cubed, Monthly Mission Ministries. And M-Cubed served our local community in many ways for several years. Paul says that this power within us has a purpose. He told the Ephesians and he tells us, that with the presence and the power of Christ in us and the love of God around us, we can go out and accomplish far more than all we could ever ask or imagine. What an exciting promise as we move into the next 175 years that God has prepared for us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
ask you to raise one hand, asking God to fill us with that presence of Christ and with that power of the Spirit. It sounds like a selfish thing, but it's not because we are filled with that power so that we can share it with others. And I go back to the theme of last week. We like, we follow, and we share. So we lift one hand asking for God's presence and power to be in us, and then we can lift another hand asking God to work through us to do things that we could never even imagine to reach others. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God within us and the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit giving us strength. Be with us and go with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh.